Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The Lord is our light and our salvation. The Lord is the stronghold of our lives. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall declare your praise. Let us worship the Lord our God this day. Gracious and loving God, source of life itself and destiny of our souls, draw near to us, we pray, as we seek to draw near to you this day. Bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit, working among us and within us, confirming within us the good news that you have revealed to us in Jesus Christ, confirming within us your grace and love. Loving God, as we ponder the life and wonder of the gift of Jesus Christ, we also acknowledge before you that we have sinned and fallen short of your glory. In our words, in our actions, in our attitudes, we have not allowed your love to be made known. And so in the silence of our hearts, we confess our sins before you and look to you for grace and forgiveness. Hear our silent confessions, we pray. Friends, hear and believe the gospel. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. So be at peace with yourself, be at peace with all people, be at peace with God, for our sins have been forgiven. Let us pray. Transform us now, O God, evermore into the likeness of your Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The first lesson is being read from Isaiah. Chapter 50, verses 4 to 9a, a reading from Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with just a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, 
who will declare me guilty. All of them will wear out like a garment, and the moth shall eat them up. Here ends the first lesson. Psalm 118, verses 1 to 2, and 19 to 29. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you. Give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The Gospel reading is from Mark 11, verses 1 to 11, a reading from Mark. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a coal tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told him what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it, and many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those that followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest kingdom. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the Twelve. Whether we realize it or not, the act of reading the Bible always involves a level of interpretation. Words on a page are simply that, configurations of ink imprinted into pieces of paper. It's the act of reading those words and pondering what they meant and what they might mean in the context of our lives and of our world. That's when their insights and relevance begin to emerge whether as a gathered community at worship, or in a Bible study group, or in our own times of reading and study and devotion, sitting down with a passage of Scripture always invites us into the realm of imagination and contemplation and speculation and interpretation. And this is as true of the small details in a text as it is of the major themes. Attention to those little details can actually often invite us into deeper levels of engagement and contemplation of what these ancient texts might have been saying. So often the chance to pay attention to and to ponder those sometimes overlooked details reveals new facets and new insights and new glimpses even into passages that we think we know well, which might be even more true 
in those stories that we return to and reread year after year, such as today's suggested reading from the Gospel of Mark, the story of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem on what has come to be known as Palm Sunday. The story of Palm Sunday is told actually in all four Gospel accounts, although the details are slightly different in two of those four accounts. In two of the four Gospels, namely Matthew and Luke, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem is immediately followed on the very same day with his act of clearing the temple of the money changers. In Matthew and Luke, he he leaves and then he goes out to Bethany after he has cleansed the temple. In the Gospel of John, by contrast, the story of the cleansing of the temple doesn't actually follow the entry into Jerusalem, but takes place much earlier in the story, almost immediately after Jesus' baptism. The reasons for that is an act of interpretation as well. In the account that we read today, in the Gospel of Mark, the clearing of the temple does not actually take place on the same day as Jesus' triumphant entry, but he goes in and cleanses the temple on the day after Palm Sunday. So what happened later that same day, that first Palm Sunday in Mark, after the adoring shouts of Hosanna had quieted down? All that we are told in the Gospel of Mark is that, is that, and I quote, Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. No cleansing of the temple. He simply went into the city and the temple, looked around at everything, and left. And we think, well, there's not much action in that, is there? Why include that detail at all? What, what's the author trying to tell us or signal to us or suggest by the inclusion of that brief comment? In asking such a question, we find ourselves then in the realm of imagination and contemplation and speculation and interpretation. One of the intriguing dimensions of the study and interpretation of the Bible is that there's actually nothing that we might notice that hasn't already been noticed before. We've had this text now for thousands of years, and during that time, both faithful adherents and contemporary critics of religion often find some strange or troubling detail in a verse or idea found in a passage of Scripture, and they allow their difficulty with that comment or verse to undermine faith or to discount the faith of those who are trying to practice it. What is not as commonly acknowledged is that those who have gone before us have actually noticed the same inconsistencies and the same ambiguities and same ideas, but rather than dismissing those passages, they've used those questions and the things that they've noticed and wondered about to venture deeper into the texts leaving with, for us, a wonderful treasure trove of resources to draw from when we find something confusing or challenging or unclear. Earlier this week, when I sat down to write the sermon, I took a few moments to actually go down into the church library, which is located just across the hall from the boardroom in, uh, outside the office at the church, and it's really worth a visit if you're downtown. Elizabeth Parody has done a beautiful job at cataloging, all, at cataloging all of the books and resources that the library contains. And as I went down there, I did so specifically to read through a few different commentaries about this passing comment in Mark chapter 11, that Jesus just went around the city, looking around and on the temple in the evening after the festivities of Palm Sunday. So what did those who've gone before us have to say about this detail in Mark? Well, one commentator wrote in relation to this comment about Mark Jesus' activities on that night, and again I quote, This sentence is accounted an editorial one, wrote the commentator, making the transition from the entry into Jerusalem to the lodging at Bethany. Yet, there is in it an unforgettable picture which would make a great subject for a painting. Jesus going quietly about the city, looking at everything. The commentator then used that looking at everything comment to reflect on what Christ Christ might have seen that evening as he looked around at everything in the city and in the temple. Perhaps he saw money changers closing up shop for the day, perhaps poor widows throwing their last coins into the temple treasury, perhaps religious authorities proudly parading themselves around and calling attention to themselves. Perhaps Roman soldiers 
flexing the muscles of their imperially delegated powers in that city that was supposed to be an exemplary community in this world and in the temple which was meant to be a place of worshipful, reverent, holy encounter with God. There is so much that Jesus might have seen when he looked around at everything. But that same commentator then used those reflections to pose questions that we are all wise to ponder. Like, what might Jesus see if he spent time looking at everything in this city or in the places of worship of this city? Might he see perhaps the homeless poor sleeping on grates in the shadows of business towers? Might he see newcomers and ordinary folks desperately trying to find safe and stable housing for themselves and for their loved ones? Might he see people suffering in situations of disrespect and indignity? Might he see people angrily yelling at each other and hatefully denouncing each other on the basis of differing ideologies and perspectives about events in our world? Might he see lonely souls struggling simply to keep going in the midst of the hustle and bustle of life? What might he see if he arrived in this city and spent a bit of time looking around at everything? And would he see those who bear his name in this city doing their best not to turn a blind eye to such realities, but instead doing their best to serve in the midst of the struggles and heartaches and challenges of life? It's interesting to read the reflections in that commentary about what Jesus might have seen then and what he might see now. Another commentator interpreted the words in a slightly different way and wrote, and again I quote, In recording this visit to the temple, Mark has no intention of depicting Jesus as a pilgrim who has come to Jerusalem for the first time and had a natural desire to see all things. The point is rather that Jesus is the Lord of the temple who must inspect its premises to determine whether the purpose intended by God is being fulfilled. It's an interesting perspective. The commentator was suggesting that Jesus was not just a typical young tourist who came with his friends from the small town to the big city, but rather was the one whose arrival should have been celebrated in the city of David and in the temple of God. And what did he find? Well, the answer to that question is not offered, but the questions it raises are equally important for us to ponder. If Jesus were to arrive in our places of worship, in, in, this, in our, these places in our, in our city that are supposed to be dedicated to his ways and his purposes, would he fi- find things in good order, he who is the Lord of the temple? Would he be comfortable with how we spend our time, how we allocate our resources, how we use our places of worship to serve his purposes, how we treat each other when we're together as a community of faith, how we care for friend and stranger alike, and whether we're actually modeling what it means to be a community that in his own words was to be distinguished by the love that we have for each other. By this shall all know you are my disciples, he said, if you have love for one another. Would the Lord of the temple find a community that he would be proud to call his own if he were to show up and look around? Again, an interesting interpretive perspective in that commentary. A third and final commentary read these words in a different way, specifically as a verse that, and I quote, was the quiet before the storm. I found that interesting. The story is indeed placed the beginning of that fateful week in Jesus' life. Jesus, and because of that, because of that, the commentator subsequently wrote, Jesus was not recklessly plunging into unknown dangers. He was doing everything with his eyes wide open. When he looked round everything, he was like a commander summing up the strength of the opposition and his own resources preparatory to the decisive battle. Again, those words offer an intriguing possibility for how we interpret this passage about Jesus walking around and looking at everything. That, that it was all preparation for what was about to happen. Like a serious long-distance runner who studies the course in detail before they even get to the starting line, or a good coach who spends some time researching the strengths and weaknesses of their competitors before the game begins, or a musician or actor who arranges to stand on a stage or play the instrument or sing to the empty hall 
before the audience arrives and the performance begins, Jesus was preparing for what was about to happen, taking a few moments to quietly wander through the city and the temple on that evening of that day at the beginning of that week to stop, to take stock of the place that would become so decisive in the next days of his life. And those are only three of the many countless numbers of interpretations that have emerged over the past 2,000 years as those who have gone before us have paused over that one verse and wondered what Jesus might have been doing or what he might have seen when he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple and when he looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. We don't know entirely, and there's actually nothing wrong with that. Faith is not rooted in absolute certainty about every detail or nuance in these ancient texts, nor in the need for absolute knowledge of all things. But faith does open us to mystery and to possibility and to speculation and imagination and interpretation and ultimately to God. And in that, there's something quite profound to see in this passage. That is, whatever Jesus saw when he looked around this temple and the city did not detract him or deter him from the purpose of his coming to that city and to this world. Might he have been discouraged by what he saw when he looked around? Quite likely. Might he be equally disappointed by what he would see if he walked the streets of this city? In some ways, probably. But did he give up? Did he turn around and head back to Nazareth, throwing up his hands in discouragement and disappointment about the state of the world? Nope. He continued on his journey that week through the tumultuous events of the following days towards that moment of humble servanthood when he broke bread and shared a cup and washed his disciples' feet on their last night together before going out into that darkened garden and being betrayed with a kiss. And then it led to the judgment hall of Pilate and to the hill called Calvary. He continued on his journey and he invites us to accompany him because It was the journey that would indeed lead him through suffering to restoration, through despair to hope, through death to resurrection. Of course, you know, that's all interpretation, but it's also really good news. Thanks be to God, and amen. Let us affirm our faith together. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, creator of all life, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God, who delivers us from death to life. We trust in God the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
May the love of the Almighty God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the comfort and friendship of God's Holy Spirit go with you and dwell with you and those you love, this day and forevermore. Amen.